Hi everyone and welcome to the uh, ninth Time for a Pint Virtual Get Together. I'm Chris um, and I am joined today by my uh, fantastic co-host Matt. Hello Matt. Good morning, how's things? All right, all right. Do you want to introduce one of our guests? I will, I will, thank you. I'm very pleased to be able to introduce um, RJ Brewer, founder of Fratello Watches and instigator of a small hashtag on Instagram called Speedy Tuesday that maybe some of you have heard of. So welcome RJ. Thank you. Uh, and I'm very pleased to introduce Bill Son. Uh, Bill is one of the moderators on uh, the Omega Forum. Uh, we have had the pleasure of, um, well, not always the pleasure, sometimes I've done things that have upset him, but we've, we've had the pleasure of exchanging messages for years on the Omega Forums. Um, I think a few people that are here probably have done the same. Um, it is a real pleasure to actually get together and talk and see each other face to face. So welcome along, Bill. Thank you. Uh, and I think today we are going to start with RJ. So I'm going to start sharing the screen. There are, you're about to see lots of pictures of lots of watches. Um, and this first one is going to give it away. Um, anybody that was expecting Speedmasters is in for a shock. So RJ, over to you. Yeah. So for today, it sounds a bit like giving a, a talk uh, in, uh, in, in, in elementary school about my rabbit, but today it's about a watch. And um, it's about the Pro Prof. Um, if you can flip to the next picture, because this lengthy reference number is uh, nobody takes note. Um, this is my uh, my Pro Prof, the Pro Prof uh, 1200 that I uh, purchased uh, last year. And um, um, I did so because I always wanted the Pro Prof. Um, in my early days of collecting, like early 2000s, when I was just uh, or late 90s, starting on Time Zone, where I also virtually uh, met uh, Bill and uh, amongst others. Uh, the Pro Prof was of my interest, but it was such a huge watch. And uh, at that time, I, uh, I looked a bit different, a bit smaller, you could say. Uh, so it, it didn't make sense for me to, to go after a Pro Prof, although in hindsight, uh, those prices were pretty good uh, back then. Um, I was offered one from a, from a first owner with boxes and papers. The guy got it from his parents for getting his, uh, his diving um, uh, certificate. And he offered it for like 750 euros, uh, which would be a very good, uh, good deal. But I didn't take it, but one of my friends did. And he also now writes for uh, Fratello. Um, I was in a long uh, debate with myself whether I should get a vintage one, the 600, or the, the new one, the 1200. Um, this 1200 was reintroduced in, uh, in 2009, um, and I remember it uh, vividly, and I think it's one of the first Omega re-editions that they really properly did at Omega. Um, if you can remember the Speedmaster from 98, 97 or 98, uh, the, they called it a replica, a bit of a dumb name. Um, later on, they called it a relaunch, but it was like a 57 re-edition, and it was just a normal moon watch with a different handset and a different bezel. And if you look at this watch that was introduced in 2009, I think they really did a proper job by uh, doing a, doing a re-edition of, of something uh, very cool from uh, the late 60s, early 70s, the original one. I think it was introduced in 69, and I think it hit the market in 71, but uh, yeah, don't, uh, it's from the top of my head, so don't take it as a, as a fact. Um, as said, I was debating, should I go vintage or should I go for the new one? And uh, a friend of mine had uh, both and he gave me the opportunity to wear both. And I did so for um, almost one and a half years <laughs> that he gave both watches to me. And um, it also uh, showed a bit of the issue that uh, the vintage one had. Um, the movements in those were not the very best movements that uh, Omega ever did. Um, so it, it ran into some issues and after Googling a bit and looking on Omega forums, uh, it, I was not the only one. Um, it's that. And I also want, in the end, I wanted to watch that I could wear during holidays. And I don't have really wild holidays. It's just a matter of having a swimming pool near the hotel or campsite or whatever. But I wanted to have a watch that, that you basically can wear every day and you don't have to take, take it off or don't have to take, to be very cautious with it. And um, I decided to go for the new one uh, for that, only for that reason, basically, that it's a modern watch. It looks good. It's a good reinterpretation of something very cool. And you can wear it every day. And um, one of my friends, he wears it every day. And 
at some point I wondered, is it comfortable? And I, then I just, last year, I, I decided to go for this one and just give it a go. Uh, if I don't like it, I can always sell it. There are websites out there that, uh, that, that help, <laughs> that helps you with that. But um, I just gave it a go. But the issue was last year I contacted Omega and they said, yeah, um, this watch is discontinued. And that was around March or April, 2019. Um, so yeah, some ADs m m probably might have one still, or but I didn't really want to 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 make it a big search. But but at Omega they said, well, it's out of production, but um, yeah, we can make you one. <laughs> so so <laughs> they made me one, <laughs> and um, I could pick it up um, during the um, time to move uh, event last year in in in, uh, in Switzerland where, uh, when we still met with brands and and people to to look at watches those old days and uh, so I picked it up and yeah I, I just wore it the entire summer uh, almost and it uh, I wear it more often than I thought and it's really a cool watch and if you can go to the to the second picture uh, uh, Chris yeah um, there we are you can see a bit more detail um, the other one shows a bit of the depth but uh, at this watch you can see really some some proper details so the difference I think most of you will know the, the original uh, Ploprof 600 has a monoblock case, meaning everything comes out and goes in through the crystal. So the bezel needs to, to come off and the crystal, and then everything is installed through the, through the, the front of the watch. Uh, this watch has a, uh, uh, it's not a monoblock, so it has a case back that can be uh, uh, put uh, on and off. Um, so this watch also has a hel helium valve. It's, uh, you see the or orange button, but on the other side of the, the right thing on, of the watch, uh, there's a helium, uh, helium uh, valve. Uh, um, the original watch didn't need one because it's a monoblock case. And if you have a monoblock case, you don't need a helium valve. Um, on the left, you see the crown, and that's also a bit of a difference with the original one, uh, where it, it, it is, it's just a different type of crown protector. Uh, with this one, you just uh, turn the crown, and um, the, the thing comes uh, uh, off a bit, and then you can can pull the crown and uh, and set the uh, set the time and date. Uh, the old one, you you turn the little square thing at the end of the crown. Um, the bezel, it's not uh, ceramic, but it's I think it's some kind of, it's sapphire. I'm not entirely sure. So it looks ceramic, but it's not, and it's very legible watch basically. Um, it comes on this uh, this shark bracelet or mesh bracelet. Uh, you could also buy it on a rubber strap. I I bought a I got a rubber strap actually from the Milan boutique when I was there. A uh, black one that, that that fits it. You need to cut it on the exact size, and you need to use the the clasp of the of this watch, of this bracelet. If you can go to the next one, yeah. So here's the case back. As you can see, they have these uh, little bolt kind of uh, uh, incisions or cuts that, that you you need a special tool to get it uh, get it off. And this is, I think, the main difference with the original one. That the original one is monoblock. This one is a, a three part case basically. Um, it's 1,200 meters water resistance, but uh, yeah, for, I don't know if we have any Dutch people in the chat, but I only have my first swimming license, which is quite bad actually. Um, so I don't really swim um, uh, that deep, or I can't even dive, but uh, my, my, my watch can, so that's important. This watch has uh, the in-house caliber 8500. Um, it was their first in-house developed movement after the 50s and 60s, so the, 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 the current generation, you could say, um, with a coaxial uh, escapement. And this is the proper coaxial escapement because before the coaxial escapement was used in the, in the ETA movements that uh, Omega used. Um, but that coaxial escapement had a bit of a, yeah, a concession was made basically towards the design of uh, George Daniels. And with this movement, it is, it is uh, uh, perfectly on point with, uh, with Daniels' uh, design of the, of the tooth of the, of the coaxial escapement. Um, so this one is discontinued. Um, the only ones they do have is the titanium one, which is also, was also an option. It's much more expensive, I have to say. It's around 10,000 euros. This one was 8,000 euro. And yes, I pay that. Um, the titanium ones, um, to me, they also come on a shark bracelet. And what happened was if I, if I touched the titanium ones and I moved the, 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 the bracelet a bit back and forth, it, it sounded like plastic, like squeaking plastic. And I just could not get used to that, and especially not for this, this, this kind of price point. And the weight, I think with this watch so big, 
um, the, the, the weight should also be somewhat in, 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 yeah, in balance with the watch. If I have a watch this big, I want to feel it. Um, and for the rest, the, 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 the advantage of the titanium one is it has the new movement. So the master chronometer movement, which is a step up uh, from this movement, but in, in essence is the, based on this one as well. And it doesn't have a date. And of course, the original ProProf has a date, but I am not a fan of date windows on my uh, watches. So I could have done without a date. Uh, when I wake up, I see the time on my iPhone and I see the date and I'm not super clever, but I can remember that date for the rest of the day. I don't need to have a date on my watch to be reminded of it all the time. Um, if you can switch to the next picture, please. Yeah, so this is the crown. Um, with the original one, you operate uh, the end piece, and with the, with this one, you just operate the crown. And if you turn it lo uh, long enough, then it uh, it uh, it comes out, and you have to push it back in and then uh, turn the crown to get it right. Um, if someone, so I didn't explain the little button. If you can go back to, oh no, go to the next pic, please. Now, oh, can you go two <laughs> two pictures back? <laughs> yeah, this is also yeah. Yeah, yeah, this is fine. So the orange button uh, there um, is very cool. I press it uh, like a few times every hour because I'm nervous. But it's to uh, to um, to unlock the the bezel. It's a bidirectional bezel, so not unidirectional, it's bidirectional. And by pushing the button, you have to keep it pushed. Basically, you keep well, you keep it pushed, and then you can rotate the bezel back and forth. It's very easy. Um, when I used it last year for the first time in the water, one of those rare moments that I was in the swimming pool, um, I noticed that you hardly can turn the bezel. So I emailed Omega, someone I know there, and um, I said, is this normal? And he said, yeah, it should go a bit heavier, but it should be able to, to turn, but it's, it's also a good kind of extra mechanism to put it in place, but uh, the button does the work. But you will notice if you push the button and turn the bezel underwater, it is, it is very tough to do so. So if you can uh, go forward to the, uh, where were, yeah, yeah, this one. So it's a bit of a big watch, you could say. And here it shows, it's, uh, it's very thick. It, I think uh, I've got to, to measure it for this, uh, for this Zoom call, for this, uh, um, for this show, but I think it's 17 millimeters. So my normal moon watches, the one that I uh, actually collect, are around 13, 13 and a half millimeter, and this one is 17. So it's 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 really a chunk of of metal. Um, you could also see by the the thickness of the the bracelet, the bracelet is really thick. So it really shows how thick the entire watch is. But nevertheless, if you click one next, here it's on my wrist, and my wrist is about 18 or 19 centimeters. Um, so it's quite okay. I don't have super huge wrists. But um, perhaps it's also a bit of the, the, the shape of the wrist. Some people have a bit of a flat top. I have a bit of a flat top wrist. It's, <laughs> it's very awkward to talk about wrist shapes here. But it's, uh, it looks very uh, good and cool. And it, it's, it's more comfortable than I thought. Uh, at some point, I was a bit of a paneristi. I'm not uh, super um, proud. But at some point, I was a, a paneristi early 2000s. And um, I had a few. And I have to say, this watch is more comfortable on the wrist than the, the Panerai Luminar Marina I had in 44 millimeters. I noticed that I took those watches off at the end of the day. That could also be because of the leather straps that become, became more stiff and a bit in their way. At the end of the day, when I came home from, from work, I took the watch off. And this watch I can just keep on my wrist all day long, uh, also in the evenings, no problem. And it's just a cool looking watch. I, I think I wrote it on the, the Fratello watches uh, Instagram account today that I also have a Rolex Submariner and I had many of those and I had Sea Dweller. Um, this watch is much cooler. And I think for the same, more or less the same amount of money, I think this is something with a, with a cool story. It looks different than all the other things. It's, and if you have it on your wrist, it's a super serious diving watch. And uh, although I'm not a diver, I like the looks, I like how it feels, I like how it's built. And I had hoped for, for this year or next year that they will perhaps come with a very cool pro prof uh, edition that is a bit more towards the original one because, uh, well, it was from 69 introduced and then in 71 it hit the market. So we still have a bit of time, but uh, yeah, I don't know what they will do with it, but I hope they will do something cool with the pro prof especially because they discontinued this one. And I think there's room enough to, uh, for some little improvements and perhaps uh, 
thin out the collection a bit because now you see they also have it in gold and titanium, full titanium um, in, in, in different colors. And I think they, I, I wish that they just will narrow down the collection a bit more to really um, yeah, original and true to the original pieces. That makes more sense to me. And, uh, but yeah, I, I wear this one a lot. It's a, it's a cool piece. And, Very cool piece. Uh, yeah. So that's my, uh, that's my pro prof story. So I'm super happy that uh, Omega was willing to, uh, to, to make me one, to push out one extra. And um, it comes in a cool box. I don't, I'm moving. So all my boxes are in boxes. But it comes with this, this cool box with a zipper. And, um, and you definitely have to get uh, the rubber strap as well. If you look at Chrono24, for example, or uh, perhaps Omega Forms as well, I think the prices of pre-owned ones are around 5.5K. And I think there's no cooler diving watch, new diving watch than, than this, basically, for that money. It is super cool. I, so when, when you said that this was the watch you were bringing, and, I, and we were joking on the setup call earlier this week, and, and I said, like, the model number for this is like 5,000 digits, which it kind of is, uh, and ended up on the Omega website just to check I got the right one and, and was looking at everything there is currently. And you're right, it's crazy. There's like precious metals and titaniums and seven different colors. And uh, yeah, I don't know where you start. Um, I, I also like that on the one that you have, it has the solid case back. I, I find it a, a clear case back on a, on a 1200 meter dive watch, kind of mm -hmm. crazy, but. Yeah. Impressive though, isn't it? That is an impressive thing to put a, yeah, a and display case wise, back in. Yeah. 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 And um, yeah, I see someone, uh, Balrash, I hope I pronounce your name right. What's the loom like? Man, it's crazy. <laughs> it, it, it lights up the room. If I, if I bring my daughter to bed in the evening and it's all dark and I wear this watch, she goes all happy because there's a lot going on, on this, in this watch in the dark. So the loom is crazy. Also on the bezel. So the numerals on the bezel, they also uh, uh, loom. So I remember you talking, it was maybe a couple of summers ago we were talking, you were saying like in Europe around pools, you see Seamaster 300s, the kind of Bond watch mm -hmm. everywhere. Um, did you have one of those that this is replaced or was this like, uh, this was your urge for like a, a oh, summer man. watch? Never sell a watch. So I have those. <laughs> <laughs> no, I have a Seamaster 300M from, um, I don't know from when, I, I bought one in 2000 and I sold that one, bought one back, sold it, bought one back, sold it. And then I learned, I bought one back two years ago and I kept it. Yeah. And I have the one, the, the Chronocraft uh, um, Seamaster 300M. Uh, first I bought it in titanium and later on I bought uh, the titanium, tantalum and the rose gold one. Oh. And that, that, that one is awesome. Beautiful. And I remember when I was young, when it was uh, out, um, as I said, I was a bit different. I was a bit smaller and I, I tried one and my, my cuffs didn't go over it. So it was a bit of a crazy watch. And I remember that the tri-metal one, so the titanium, tantalum, and rose gold was super expensive. It was like crazy. And now you can pick them up for that cheap. I think I paid two and a half K wow. with box papers, everything there. And yeah, it's a super cool watch. It's a lot of fun. And um, yeah, it, it doesn't need to be always super expensive to, uh, to have something fun, I think. Absolutely. Um, I'd, any more questions? I'd love to. But there aren't, surprisingly. Oh. Um, I'd, I'd love to take one of these diving, though. I'd love to take one of these diving. I think they'd be, be a really good thing to use underwater. It would be cool. Oh, um, man, it's a great watch. Yeah. Without I, I mean, I must admit, I, when they first, uh, as RJ mentioned, you know, a few years ago, when they first brought them back as a, a replica, kind of homage or whatever they called it in those days, um, I went in to try one on. And obviously, they, they tend to come on that rubber strap, which yeah. needs to be cut to size. Yeah. So I'm there, there in the store, trying to pull this thing down and going, yeah, you know, it's obviously quite big on the wrist, but I think I look fantastic and sit really well over three or five mils of neoprene. And the, the, the lady who was serving me looked as if I was completely mad and kind of went, wait, you take it diving? And I was like, <laughs> <laughs> welcome to the world of Amiga yeah. boutiques, I guess. <laughs> yeah. you know. and, and Omega also did a gold one of this. I think it was for the only watch auction in uh, Monaco and they made one in full gold uh, oh, with a white dial good. and white bezel. And from what I heard, because we did the Seamaster 300 magazine uh, two years ago. So we were in their archives uh, for some days to do some digging. And um, they told me that uh, they, they still have it uh, in their archives. They had like a copy of the watch. Uh, the archive's not as in paperwork, but it's in their watch archive, basically. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. And uh, it, cool. it was a, f a full gold ProProf case. It was unreal. 
and uh, I'm not sure yeah. if someone because this one I also I have the the Moonshine Gold Speedmaster and that weighs quite a quite a bit, but this one is in steel and it's it's much heavier. There's no comparison. It's uh, it's crazy. So the solid gold plow prop is going to be super crazy with a oh. mesh mesh gold bracelet. That is the watch you oh, need, RJ. Yeah. Ultimately, that you is, need that yeah. gold That's mesh. Bad. That yeah. is Omega bling. And that, so, I need a seven series. One, one of the, one of the, <laughs> another, sorry, a quick question that has just come in. Sanders said, "How do you size the mesh bracelet?" That was a uh, horror because uh, I got it. I bought it at Omega in, in Switzerland, and. Um, it has screws, so some of the links, uh, it has links. So the bracelet is not one piece of, of mesh. It is one piece of mesh to a certain point. And then you can see that there are some bars in between. And uh, there you have to, uh, to resize it. And it's just, uh, I think it's pins, but it was resized for me. And even the watchmaker who did it for me, it took him quite a while. He got all nervous at some point <laughs> because it took so long. But it was uh, not easy. So I, I don't know if you, you can really easily do this yourself, and especially not if you don't have like proper tools. Um, so yeah, you have to do it at the boutique or whoever is selling it to you. Thank you. Cool. cool. Um, should we move on to the next watch? Thank you, RJ. Thank you. Well, right on. Um, so uh, I think we're, we're moving on to Bill's watch, which may set the theme for everything we're talking about this afternoon. And I don't want to give too much away. Um, but Bill, over to you, my friend. Right on, okay. Uh, Chris, next slide, please. Uh, this is a, when, I, when we heard during the planning session that RJ was gonna pull out his pro clock, I pulled out my old original one that I actually bought from a guy off of eBay. And he said, yeah, it was in, he was a diver and it was in the glove box of his minivan or I think it was Volkswagen van for you know 15 years. So it's, Size-wise, in comparison to the modern one, they are within a millimeter in the dimension-wise, but this is a monocoque case. Um, the shark mesh bracelet on that one is, does not have removable links. I have an eight-inch wrist, and I had to go through about five or six of them until I found one that was actually long enough, one contiguous piece of mesh. So that's the story with that watch. But what I wanted to talk about today was a watch that really... Uh, set the mood of my collecting. And I've been collecting Omegas since about the late 80s, and I stopped in about 1992 because uh, my parents' home was burglarized. And I had, a, at the time I had a Speedmaster, I think a Bubbleback, a Hoya Carrera, and I think two or three other watches, and that was it, and I stopped collecting. Um, flash ahead a couple years, I was down in Georgetown. Go to the next slide, Chris. And uh, I moved outside of DC and I went to the Georgetown flea market just to see what was going on. And I'm walking around the flea market. One thing leads to another. There's a guy there selling watches. And there were two guys holding this watch up in their hands. And wow, this is cool. Isn't that cool? And I, and I heard and I went over to sort of standing behind them, sort of looking over their shoulder. I said, oh, that is kind of interesting. I haven't seen a C-Mesh like that before. And, you know, I don't know if we should buy it. It's too much money. They put it down. They walk away. I quickly pick the watch up. I look at it for two minutes. I ask the guy how much it was. And I go, fine, it's done. I gave him the money. I put the watch in my pocket, started walking away. I noticed I was at the next cart and the two guys came back and said, okay, we'll buy the watch. And the guy, Harold, is, I'm sorry, it's gone. <laughs> And they were freaking out. They were screaming. What do you mean gone? We were here not two minutes ago. It's gone. But um, that watch changed. What, that was the first watch I bought in two or three years. I got it home. I thought it looked great. And as you can tell, that is the original bezel. And that is the Achilles heel of this model. It's a thin enameled inset bezel, or the insert actually. And this is a 2913-3, which I've read in some places should not have a countdown bezel. This has a countdown bezel. Um, this watch is about as original as you can get. Um, the only thing that's not original in this watch in this picture is the replacement crystal. And I'll get into that in a second. So basically I get this watch home, I put it on a strap, it's losing six minutes a day. One thing leads to another. Boy, I'm down in DC. I have no idea who a watchmaker is. 
So next thing I know, I look for a watchmaker. And I found two guys, one that did a lot of Omega work, but I went to his door in his uh, office and he said, gone for the month of June. So he was on holiday. And then there was this other guy that was supposed to be an excellent watchmaker. Supposedly he does stuff at the White House. So pay no attention to that ringing in the background. That has nothing to do with this meeting. And I called this guy. His name was Dan. I'm not going to use his last name. I said, Dan, I hear you're a really great watchmaker. You know, I have a watch I want you to service. He said, okay. Um, I go, where's your office? And I work from my home. I said, great. Okay. I said, but I don't meet anybody at my home. So why don't you meet on Georgia Avenue at the McDonald's? I'll be there tomorrow morning having breakfast at 930. And pay no attention to that ringing in the background. So I go to this, this McDonald's off the, off the loop on Georgia Avenue at 930 in the morning. There's a guy there eating a couple of Egg McMuffins. And I said, do you think he could fix this watch? And he puts his Egg McMuffin down, wipes his hand. And he's looking. I said, yeah, no problem. I said, it'll take a month. So I give it to him. And I said, okay, I'll see you in a month. How crazy am I? I go into a, a McDonald's, guy's eating an <laughs> Egg McMuffin, and I hand this watch to him. Seems perfectly sane, Bill. Perfectly sane. Totally sane. Okay. <laughs> so I do that. I get a call from him a month later. Watch is all done. The movement's perfect. It's great. And I was even able to source an original Omega crystal for it. So why don't you go on to the next slide? And here's a side profile. And I love this dome crystal. It is great. Uh, the only thing I did here is a spoiler alert. I added the bracelet to it. All my other photos had was, was without the bracelet, but these photos came out even better. And you can see the crown also has the little mark inside the Omega. That was uh, the, basically the signature of, of the early Naiad crowns. So since these did not have a screw down crown, the idea was the deeper you go, more pressure is being pushed against the crown, against the case, against the case tube, and it creates a better seal. The only problem where that kind of fails is when you're in two feet of water and you don't have a real differential in pressure. Um, go on to the next slide, please. And here's the nine o'clock side of the case. Um, the lugs are sloping. The only thing that's missing on my watch is actually the loom dot inside the bezel. That was never there, and I never decided to put it back in. Um, it, has some, it has some nicks, it has some marks, but um, this is an honest watch. Go on to the next slide, please. And where are we at? Okay. And if you look closely, um, Chris, can you move your mouse on top? Thank you. There is the signature, the Omega signature on the crystal of the watch, and you can also see the detail of the crown once again. Um, it's, this is, like I said, this is the watch that brought me back into collecting Omegas. And, um, let me see where we are here. So after, oh, I'll, I'll tell you a little something that was upsetting me. Go to the next slide. So when I got this home, there was no books or references what a, C, uh, uh, a 2913 was. So I get home, I open it up the case, and here's the, oh, I, I'm sorry, that's the case back shot, huh? Here's the case back shot on the, on basically, this is the sister watch to the Speedmaster 2915, and the Railmaster 2914, and it was there, you know, basically high precision or high pressure. This happened to be the certified high pressure version of those three watches. Um, all three watches, just to digress a little, had a high level of machine precision. When we go to the next screen, Chris, you can see the big thing that Omega did with these models of these three watches. You see the black O-ring, and if Chris, if you want to be the Vanna White and sort of circle the crown, the arrow around, they had a machine that to a very high tolerance for you to be able to get a 200 meter water resistance. And this was the signature of every Seamaster going forward. And every Speedmaster, because remember, every Speedmaster has a little Seamaster in it. And, you know, that's, that's basically that DNA there. And what got me really upset, if you go to, actually, we'll go to the next slide. Here's the inside of the case back of the 2913-3. SE stands for that it's a sweep second movement. 
and it's an HF case. And what's really neat, it's, a, it's still more patent pending on the case design. And interesting, I never thought about this, but if you look at a Sutina DS, and HF also made those cases, and the early ones in the late 50s were also patent pending cases. So I'm curious if it might have the same, might be the same patent, I don't know. But there's something I've just been thinking about. So if you go to the next slide, and this is what really bummed me out when I got home. I opened the watch up. I said, oh man, it's only 20 joules. I wanted it, I got ripped off. I wanted a 24 joule movement in my watch. And unknowns to me, the first generation Seamaster 2913s had caliber 501, which is the 20 joule version. Once in a while, you might see a 500, and that was probably for US imports, it would be a 17 joule movement. But this, you know, so this is totally legit. And I just remember in the very beginning when it was only 20 joules, I was so upset that I bought this watch because I would have rather gotten one with a 24 joule Omega movement. And from that point on, I had to go and figure out how am I going to find a bracelet for this watch? So Chris, if you go to the next slide, that happens to be a was it a uh, 7012 or 7912? Hold on, I got the watch on me. Yeah, 7912 bracelet. Um, I didn't have a bracelet. And remember I told you about that other watchmaker that was on holiday for the month. It took Dan a month to do the watch. Got the watch back, it's on a, on a strap. And, you know, it turned out to be mid-July. I went over to Pierre's office. And I introduced myself to him and I showed him the watch. I said, do you have a bracelet for this? He said, oh, I had a whole box of them, but I think I threw them out. And turns out this guy, Pierre, was the authorized Omega Service Center since the mid 60s. And he and I became very close friends for the next 20 plus years because any good collector knows out there, if you don't have a good watchmaker behind you, you're not going to go anywhere quick. You're not going to be successful. And Pierre was great. I haven't talked to him in about eight months, but he's getting kind of old now. And I'm not going to use his last name, but if somebody has any of those international warranty Omega books that you get in the boxes and you look up authorized service center for the United States in Maryland, his name is listed, his address is listed, and his office phone number is listed in there. So it was great. And I mean, I've gotten stuff from him over the years. Hey, do you have a, you know, a class for, for 7912? Sure, here. He, he was my go-to guy. He helped, me, he helped me learn so much about vintage products. Pay no attention to that person talking in the background. But he is the one that gave me that number eight Omega tool that you see on the screen. That is the cool, spec tool. Go ahead. That's a cool tool. Yeah. That is the number eight tool is used for the Seamaster 300. And it's also, I think, could you be used on taking the profile for part after you pop off the bezel, that tool can go and unlock the lock ring that's holding the crystal down. Oh, wow. And if you huh. have like a bumper Seamaster, you need a number six key as opposed to a number eight key. And the eight key also works on the speed master and the rail master. So awesome. he gave me that. Um, he helped me out with end links at one point. And so that's that 7912 bracelet. That's probably from 64, 65. I think I had a 7077 somewhere, but I was like wearing with that bracelet. And if you go to the next screen, there it is on my wrist. And it's been there, you know, I haven't, I think this is the first time I've taken it out of the vault. And 10 years. So the watch hasn't seen a lot of action. But it's pretty um, good though. It's all original. Like I said, you know, it's, except for the crystal, like I said, I bought it from a guy and it was just worn mm -hmm. and it was just worn to the point where it should have been serviced early and it wasn't. You had to repolish all the pivots and everything to get it to go. But that's the watch I wanted to share with you guys because it meant something real special to me. It's fantastic. It's fantastic. Nice. It does answer the question about where, like, you see these uh, like forum conversations about where all the good watches have gone, and Bill just has them all. Uh, it's. <laughs> I'm glad my wife's not listening to this. <laughs> <laughs> 
It's really cool. So this this is the is this the very first version of the Seamaster three hundred? Yeah. I mean, it's not a, a twenty nine. Uh, it's not a, a twenty nine thirteen dash one. It's a dash three, but it's the same same same. It doesn't even have a luminous sweep second hand. So that's basically been right as rain. Except you know this has a countdown bezel where some people say, oh, it should have a countdown bezel. I said, you know <laughs> what? I found it that way in nineteen ninety four ninety five. In somebody's booth at a, at a at a at a flea market in Georgetown, it is what it is. Yeah. And when was this made? This is, must have been made in fifty eight or fifty nine. I forget. I, I looked at the serial number real quick, but yeah, it's fifty eight, fifty nine. It, it's it's early. Yeah, it's early, isn't it? The the countdown bezel is fantastic. I do like that a lot. It's beautiful. Now there's a guy out there that restores bezels. I remember early on a guy named I think Aldo in Italy. And yeah. he did a brilliant, brilliant job. Did a brilliant job. And people look at mine, they're like, oh, who did your bezel? I go, nobody <laughs> did my bezel. Just, just lucked out, yeah. I yeah. just lucked out. I mean, there's a, there's, if you look closely, there's a little bubble on by the 30. And it's been, it's been there since I had it. But it's all, Sick. you know, it's all legit. So very, good. very cool. Um, any questions from anyone, Matt? Or is everyone just sort of, bowled over by this there's it's... lots of there's lots of nodding smiling and typing very cool watch thank you brian, brian leach has just given away his age he said he wished he looked looked so good given he was born the same year but there we are <laughs> um i love as well bill you talking about kind of like in the mid 90s like mid 90s there wasn't there weren't as many written resources there certainly weren't as many internet resources oh, there were like the they... beginnings of forums and stuff but yeah, I mean, there was one book on, called Omega Designs by Andrew Krusler. And what was great, I, there was a, a, obviously, as being an American, we're like the redheaded stepchild in vintage Swiss watch collecting. Everything I have to get is like, you know, dog eared, translated by somebody that does stereo manuals or something. And, you know, it, it's broken. Yeah. And I was lucky enough to get a copy of Omega Designs in the original German pressing, which had a lot more stuff in it. I just don't understand German, but I sort of but that's fixed okay. some of it out. It's got more pictures, so you're winning, right? It did. It, 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 had, it had like two complete catalogs in it. It was, it was yeah. amazing. Wow. wow. It had a lot of uh, movement information, that book. Well, that's upstairs. I mean, I, I, I value having a reference library and we were talking about that uh, before, you know, we went live here, but don't cheap out. If there's a book out there that you think you're going to want, you get the book. Yeah, I agree. Definitely get the book. Yeah, absolutely. It's nice to have these physical resources that you can sit and go through as well. And it's like, I know I'm, just... ki I'm kind of old school that way. It's not all PDF. No, but sometimes these, these books are very expensive. If you look at the Moonwatch only and the Mondani books, Mm. Um, they are very expensive so I think people are stopped by the fact that these books are so expensive but on, on the other hand if these books can prevent you from making a much more expensive mistake I think it's really well worth the investment and those old books like uh, Anton Kreutzer uh, Omega Designs I don't know I, I think I picked mine up for like 80 euros or perhaps even less. right I think, that. I think it's still around there it's really uh, worth getting one agreed yeah very cool thank you Bill so, anytime so Bill, man just before we move on, one final question. Sandra said, this restarted your collecting career very yeah, that, quickly, that very was, quickly. Any yeah. other highlights that followed and did they exceed the beauty of this 2913? This one, this one is all like as found perfect. Um, the answer is yes. If just so everybody knows my history, I was a moderator since about 96 or 97 at WatchNet. Then I was a moderator for the Omega Forum at Time Zone. Then I was a moderator for the Omega Forum at Purist. And now I'm the, the Omega, one of the Omega moderators at Omega Forums. So um, highlights of watches, I have a 2915. And my friend Pierre helped me get it all back together. And I said, you know what? This replica came out, and I agree with RJ. That is a horrible name to call it, but it gave me the ability because Pierre was great because he had a parts account with Omega and Lancaster. Can you order me the bezel? He ordered a bezel for me. He ordered me. I said, well, these hands are great, but they don't glow. I want glowing arrow hands. So he ordered me a set of glowing arrow hands, and I think I have the old hands somewhere in a box. 
So they're, 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 they're swappable, aren't they? The modern is swappable to the Well, the hand, yeah, because, the, because an 861 and a 321 from a handset is same, same. Huh. From the pinion sizes. The um, bezel as well. Bezel, uh, he had to tweak it a little, but it was, it, it was bigger than it should have been, yeah. but he had, he had to pin it a little to get it onto the case, which is fine. It is what it is. And, um, you know, I had a 2914. I uh, discovered the white dial rail master, which was the, basically the bridge between the RAF 53 thin arrow and the 2914. I wrote a, a pretty extensive article about that. It took me about 10 years to get to track it all down. I've done stuff with Bach, um, Omega chronometer de boards, which I wrote, you know, if you search the internet, I think it's still listed on Purus. It's a pretty in-depth article of every movement they use for chronometer de board. I mean, I've done a lot of, there's a lot of highlights and I don't want to get into it. If, if you want yeah. to find them, Google my name and Omega, most of them pop up. Some of the early stuff is still on Chuck Maddox's website. That's being supported by uh, Jeff Stein at chronomatics. Cause Chuck and I worked hand in hand for many, many years. And when he left, when he was gone, it was very upsetting. Yeah. But Thank I don't you. want to end on a low note cause I am. No, avid, no, no, no. Cause I'm an avid fan of Matt's. Um, uh, so, I don't know what to say to that. <laughs> There's an in joke in this, but we won't get there. Is. I, I also like well, the, uh, the, the ignore all of this with the chimes going on in the background. When we were doing the setup call, we were in, uh, in one of Bill's other rooms, which has just a few uh, Chelsea ships yeah. box. Which at some point, when I can get to the US, we'll sit down and talk about those because they're just cool. Yeah, but by the way, that was me. That was my uh, eBay notice that rang before. <laughs> <laughs> and, it, and it was for a Chelsea ship's clock. So, you know, my apologies, oh, guys. Nice. No worries. Um, uh, I'm so, just glad RJ went first. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, thank you, Bill. I think um, yeah. it's Matt's go. So, um, could it be another dive watch? Sorry, I was just checking my eBay because I was on the lookout for some uh, Charles Darwin related ephemera, but that seems <laughs> to pass me by. Uh, right. Um, yeah, so this is. Um, Look, I didn't want you to think that Chris was the only one who um, who was a kind of eBay bottom feeder. So, so this is my little little kind of uh, yeah, my my kind of example of, of what you can get at the bottom of eBay if um, if you don't know what you're looking for. So, Baylor, I've talked about before, um, Zales uh, Zales in-house brand. Next picture. The um, this is a. a, a a slightly unusual dive. I mean, it's a classic kind of 600 foot um, uh, water resistance. It's called a starfish because the case back and we'll get to that in a minute. But it's um, it's got a, a shield 1906 inside. Um, it's automatic, non quick set date, which was an absolute pain, I can tell you, because the last time I wore this was about the second or third of the month. So trying to get it up to the 23rd and trying to get the date the day right yesterday as well. That was uh, that took some time. It's got the little the little trick when you can bring it back to um, about eight o'clock, and it just got that small click, and then you can bring it forward to change the day. But um, it still takes a lot of uh, lot of twiddle action. Um, so as you can see, uh, this is um, this is a, a, a classic diver from from the late sixties, um, probably entirely useless. Uh, yesterday um, on the virtual get together eight, I spent some time slagging off a diver. This has all of those same faults, but um, I love it anyway. So, you know, sue me. Uh, next one. Um, I've talked about Bailey before, but um, they were Zales in house, um, kind of in house brand. And back in 1966, which is where this advert came from, they were trying to sell themselves as, uh, as a kind of the, the plucky newcomer. So instead of spending all that money on your Hoya or an Omega or something else, buy a Zales because it's still Swiss made. It just doesn't have a Swiss brand name. That's basically what they're saying. Um, wait a minute, somebody says, when I buy a watch, I want a name everybody knows printed right on the face of it for everyone to see. And don't we all? But, um, but that's, that's where Baylor were trying to, trying to kind of uh, place themselves in the market. And um, they obviously succeeded because um, no one else collects their watches. So, next slide. Uh, before we do um, the next one, I just want to say that the last line on this advert, if you want security, get a blanket. If you want a watch, get a veiler. It's cool though, isn't it? 
Yeah. yeah. Kind of. In a kind of like geeky, really, you know, crap American sales way, it's cool. Yeah, yeah for sure. Yeah. For sure. For sure. <laughs> <laughs> so um, one of the things... Um, uh, one of the things I do quite like about this, uh, apart from the unusual case, is these uh, plied loom rules with really thick, puffy loom. Um, you know, it's 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 old school, but I I kind of like that. You know, the kind of bonkersness of uh, of, of some of the designs you got in those days. Um, very flat hands, um, unfortunately, but uh, but those um those markers are actually pretty cool. Next one. Um, so it's a very square case, unfortunately, uh, which means wearing it isn't isn't particularly easy, and finding straps that fit is is, is equally challenging. As you can see, it's got that very square profile. Um, the lug holes very close uh, to the um, uh, to the case itself, so there are very few um, straps that fit. Certainly, modern straps that fit. Um, but um, I, I kind of like it. The crown's too small. It's really a real pain in the pain in the behind. Um, it's a, it's not screwing. Obviously, those days most of them were, were just pushing, and as um, uh, as uh, Bill said earlier, um, they, no, yeah, it was Bill said earlier. Uh, that's that's great for pressure, but you know when you've got no pressure on it, it, uh, it, it does tend to leak. Luckily, this one hasn't. Next slide. Oh, back in. So that's the profile. As you can see, really straight across. Um, with no no curve to the to the lugs at all, just that slight step down underneath. Um, not particularly attractive in, in, to my eye, um, but, but, but kind of nicely unusual. Um, I've been looking for similar cases. Most of the watches that were made for Bales were made by other people. Um, Barrage has said it's almost Art Deco. Um, Kathleen says it's bonkers. I'm, I kind of agree with Kathleen. I'm not sure it's Deco. It's more um, deck chair or something. I'm not sure it's kind of Anyway, the um, uh, most of the watches that were made for Zales were made by by other proper proper watchmakers. So I've been looking out for this case for for many years to try and find other people that used it, and I've not actually found anyone. Um, it's kind of similar to that square aqua dive shape that they used to make, but but it, it's not. Um, yeah, it's a shame really. If anyone does does uh, does know of anything similar, it'd be be good to know. Um, as Bill said, Hoya made for Baylor too back in back in the fifties and sixties. Um, there are a couple of triple cows out there that are quite cool. There's even an Octavia, which I don't have, unfortunately. Uh, final final picture. So this is why um, it's called the Starfish. I mean, obviously it's not called the Starfish. There are only like a few people who even post about this watch, so no one calls it the Starfish. Um, it's actually known as the the Gigi um, uh, after um, the 2019 movie Book Smart, but. Um, no, it's not. I just made that up. Look, I, I can say anything on this. It will get turned into internet law and will just be repeated by everyone. Um, so that's how most of the good, it's about how most of the good Omega stories started. So, so you know, let's call it the GG. So anyway, there we are, 600 you know, foot. Matt, Matt, quick question. Uh, actually, a statement. That star, I think that might be a Marvin. Yeah, I was thinking the same, Bill. You see it on their, on their water-resistant watches. Yeah, as a starfish. I should look into that. Yeah, very cool. They um, the case backs were were, were kind of cool. There's uh, this one with a guy in a speedboat. There's obviously the scuba dude and and various others. I mean, you know, they 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 have some cool case backs if you like engravings. Well, I, I remember I have one case back where um, it's kind of X-rated, and it was for a dive watch, and it was a woman just holding a jug of wine, pouring it. Oh, maybe I think she was a mermaid pouring it into the sea and she was topless that's what you need in a dive watch that's how you know it can go deep underwater it's got a half naked right. woman on the, back, the case and, and i was and i was thinking about you know the baylor uh, ad have you ever seen a certina ds box the early ones no. the tagline on it was every inch a man's watch <laughs> <laughs> i kid you not <laughs> wow <laughs> yeah um yeah advertising in those days not ideal um, slightly problematic. The Rolex ones as well. So yeah. here we are. Uh, it was World Goth Day a couple of days ago. So um, little shout out there to um, to all my brethren. Yeah, it's cool. cool. Any questions? We'll watch. No Come questions. On. Oh, actually, just mm. quickly. So as you can see, top down. There's no way you can grip that bezel apart from again the the the, the, the top between mm. uh, eleven and one and um, five and seven. 
Um, I said how much that annoyed me in the in the Cheetah uh, Black Bay steel. Um, it annoys me in this as well. But I've never dived with this, so who knows? So are we saying oh, yeah. that Tudor took inspiration for the Black Bay from this watch? No, absolutely not. <laughs> yeah. But the bezels are interesting. I mean, this one, I don't believe, ever had any luminous material. There's no sign of anything in that triangle. It just looks like a, um, uh, the, you know, like a, a slightly matte finish on it. Um, I'm not entirely sure that this would have been particularly usable at all. Um, but maybe that's what people needed in those days. It's cool. Thank you. And any questions well, for anyone else? Or? Uh, Stuart's asked a question, but I think we should come back to it. If okay. You don't mind. Okay. Uh, so um, I, I will round off this afternoon with one more dive watch because this has become a dive watch show. Um, so this is the only dive watch I have. Uh, it's a CWC Royal Navy Automatic Mark II. The long number at the bottom is their internal catalog number. So learning from the Swiss, the English are also using long numbers and letter combinations for their watches now. Um, CWC founded it in 72 by a guy called uh, Ray Meller, who had been, I think, I don't know, the head of Hamilton in the UK or dealt with military sales, but Hamilton stopped making military watches. He founded CWC, the Cabot Watch Company, to start making them. Uh, and in 1980, 1981, they started making a diver. I'm sure if Jonathan Hughes is with us, he is about to correct me all over the place. So I'll try not to get this too wrong. Um, I, uh, after years of gentle persuasion from, from Matt and others, uh, last year decided that I should give scuba diving a proper go. And of course, the first piece of equipment that I felt I needed was a dive watch. Um, because you, you actually do need to know the time. It turns out when you do the paddy qualifications, uh, you do need to know what the time is. It's one of the things you check before you dive in, in the ocean. Um, and I could have done it cheaper. I could have got a cheap dig digital watch. Absolutely could have done. But I'm uh, quite sentimental and I had the idea that I'd like to have a dive watch that is then the watch I use every time I go diving. Um, and hopefully I'll get to do that lots over the coming years and build some memories around one watch. Um, so I talked to Matt, I talked to a couple of other people, I talked to Jason Heaton. Uh, Jason said, you are British, you need to go and buy one of these. They're made in Switzerland. The guys that sell these are lovely. Um, go talk to them, go try some watches on. Um, they do lots of quartz watches, which are the ones made for the Royal Navy. They did an automatic very early on uh, in 80, 81, which has got a slightly thinner case. This is a fatter version of the quartz case. Um, and it has got a, it's an ETA in there, um, a 2824-2. So I think it's a date movement and they've just covered over the date. They did two versions of this dial, one with date window, one without, and then a Mark I and a Mark II. The Mark II glows more and has a slightly clearer outline on the fonts. Uh, it also has a sapphire crystal and a 120 click bezel, whereas the Mark I has a 60 click bezel. So um, this is a, a military designed watch. It's designed to go diving if you are in the military it is no nonsense it's very comfortable it's actually quite small like i have big wrists big hands but it's quite a small watch as far as these things go um it's 47 millimeters lug to lug 45 across including the crown and the crown guards so next to a, pl a plo prov it's tiny um and uh yeah I, I wore this diving in a pool i wore it diving in the adriatic last year uh, it has a NATO on it because that is the only thing you could fit to this watch because it has these great big fixed um, bars, uh, which are very reassuring. Um, one of my concerns was I would swim out over something deep, lose this watch off my wrist and never see it again. There's not too much chance of that with um, fixed bars and a NATO strap. Um, it, the NATO strap it's on is um, pretty tough. Uh, there were a couple, I've seen a couple of forum threads over recent months about NATO straps for summer and wanting something soft and comfortable. These are military spec ones. Um, it is thick and scratchy and um, it's, it is not soft and pliable. Um, I think they're made by Phoenix and they're kind of MOD spec. Um, but it's, really, it's actually really comfortable despite the kind of the rigidity and that it's not super, super soft. Um, and yeah, I, I love this watch. Um, I have a few more details. So it's got a great big side profile to it. Um, I, I said yesterday that the Flightmaster was 11 something mil. I've since reread the book and it is the mid case of the Flightmaster from yesterday is 11.7 mil. The whole, whole watch overall is something like 400 meters thick. Um, this watch is thinner than the Flightmaster. 
um, considerably. It, it thick, sits really I'm nicely. Sorry, how, thick, how thick is this one? So this one is, do I have it in the notes? Um, I do not have it in the notes. It is okay. about that thick. It's not crazy thick. <laughs> so it's 13 you know, it has to do the clock, by the way. And uh, I, as we were talking about that with RJ's watch, I said, shoot, I need to measure the Seamaster. And I did. <laughs> I forgot to tell you because I had a caliper right here. And the, the, the CK2913 from back of case, the top of dome, is 14.5 millimeters. If that, if that means anything to anybody. So if I can find a measuring device, I would do it more accurately. <laughs> but I can tell you it's twice the thickness of a pencil. Um, so, so there's some scientific measurement for you. Uh, it's got um, these really nice big uh, crown guards protecting the crown because if you actually take a dive watch diving, I think that is a bit of a, that can be a bit of a concern, uh, knocking the crown off and filling the watch full of water, and that's kind of the end of the watch. Um, so it's got a well protected crown. There's no branding on the crown. It's a it's a very smooth, sterile kind of thing. Um, I've taken a couple of shots at the ends because you can, you can see where the fixed um, bars are are kind of held in place. So you, you can see kind of the, the little weld marks either side of this that are captivating them. So I guess if you did some serious damage and managed to break a bar or a bar rusted through, it could be changed. Um, there's the other side profile of it. So a new crown on one side. Very, very smooth. Um, it's a mix of polished and brushed finishes. I've put a, a few scratches on this. Um, I knocked it on a scuba tank. I um, very gracelessly uh, dropped off a dock and smashed it against a set of steps. Um, when I was trying to learn how to balance out, I landed arm, face, whole body down on the bottom of the ocean. Um, so I've, I've taken this out and used it as intended. Um, my my I wear this a fair amount day in day out because it's just super comfortable and very very easy to read and I know any dumb stuff I do with water is very unlikely to hurt it um yeah more, more fixed bars and then this is the case back so they make military watches um some of this is is the kind of the catalog number for CWC um I think there's some date information in there a model number it's not the same as an issued watch. They they sometimes have issued watches come back through, and they they sell those on as well because Silverman's the company that owns. Is that stuff. not so? That's not the NATO number. It might be. I don't know. I honestly haven't looked. Um, I don't think it is because this wasn't a military watch. This variant hmm. wasn't a military watch. It I mean, it certainly looks like one. So if it's a made up NATO number, that seems a bit strange. It could it could well be the NATO number that references the the guidance for the quartz model that was yeah, made for a yeah, long time. Certainly 66.4599 for the NSM looks, looks right. Anyway, it's, it's, yeah, could, it could well be. Um, but yeah, so this is the Mark II. So it has a sapphire crystal on, which is mentioned on the back. Um, water resistant to 30 atoms. Uh, so it can go a lot deeper than I can. Uh, I am uh, qualified to go to 18 meters, which is scary enough, frankly. 300 meters, not for me. Uh, probably not for anybody, actually. Matt? We can we can get you to three hundred meters. Just wake you up enough and show you out the boat. It'd be fine. Mm -hmm. Not sure about that. Um, and yeah, and this is it. So th this is, this is my one dive watch that I have at the moment. I, I went through a period of collecting mid seventies Omega divers. I, I never got into the plow pros on a thousand meters. I had a few of the one twenties and the two hundreds, um, and they were great. But I I just didn't re really wear them a lot. Um, I think because I was worried about damaging fairly delicate bezel inserts that you can't replace um so they went and now i have this as my one dive watch that's me very cool very nice watch thanks any questions from anyone that was great <laughs> i feel um, like I've, I've speed talked you yeah i think we yeah definitely <laughs> a, bit of, a bit of speeding there um chris silverhands said um getting down to 300 meters is easy getting back up is the trick it's I, that is the point i've heard i that. think the the, the deepest scuba at 333 meters took him uh, yeah, 20 minutes or something to get down there and then another 11 and a half hours to get back up. So yeah, yeah. it's a bit tricky. Um, do not murder Chris, Matt. Oh, okay. Kathleen thinks that there might be some violence coming. <laughs> that seems a bit harsh. Right. So I said there was one question that um, had been asked earlier that we might uh, kind of end on. Um, right. Uh, Stuart Lee says, apart from the propylof, what are the panel's favourite modern diver? So I, I know this is, you haven't got much time to think about it, but 
favorite modern diver, RJ? Um, if I have enough resources, uh, Blancpain, 50 fathoms. If I don't have enough resources, which is the case, I would go for a Seiko Marine Master. Definitely. I have one, but it's a cool watch, a uh, monoblock case. The movement is based on a Grand Seiko. Um, yeah, it's a super cool diving watch and it's uh, very affordable. Thank you. Bill? I agree with RJ. Marine Master 300. Marine is, Master as well. Is the way to go. And I happen to have a few for sale, but don't tell anybody. <laughs> <laughs> You know, it was one of those things where, you know, you tell a guy you'll buy it and then another guy gets you one and you sort of feel obligated to buy both. Yeah, <laughs> there you go. I have a, I, and this is after talking to RJ about this multiple times over uh, some form of instant messaging. I got to get one of these things. You got to get one of these, Bill. You got to get one. I said, I know. And I wound up getting a couple. So that, that's, how, that's what's known as a high class problem. Yeah, very good. Right. Um, very quickly, Chris, because I know RJ needs to get to Temptation Island. Yes. Yes. <laughs> I still don't know what that is. It sounds like some, some sort of gentleman's club, but fine. Um, sort of. Sort of. I, th I think it's a whole bunch of kids on an island wearing chastity belts, but I might be wrong. Sort Who of. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're all going to be Googling this afterwards. Um, Edit it out. Edit that bit out. <laughs> yeah, I'm just going to leave that in. Um, I don't know, to be honest. I, I've, I've, I've owned quite a few dive watches. Um, I had the the um, Jack Mail Apnea Seamaster 300, which was cool. Nice. Yep. Uh, it's really big and really heavy. And I, I guess it's so big because the module that's in there for the the uh, the countdown. The, the um, yeah. uh, I I really like that watch. I I would like to have a Ploprov, and I've I've tried them on over the years and kind of lusted after them. And I have watched them over the last maybe five six years. Do it. Into... Do it. <laughs> well, I've, I've watched them creep into that thing. They're like, you could get a nice pro for maybe two and a half thousand, three thousand pounds, and now an okay pro is sort of five and a half to six thousand pounds is what people are asking, and it's it's just beyond my comfort. Like at that point, um, at that point, I, I do what you were talking about and start looking at secondhand um, modern blow props. Yeah. Um, so yeah. Yeah. maybe not right now, but maybe one day. Oh, cool. So, uh, I, uh, look, I've got to agree with the Seiko. I think Seiko makes some of the best divers in the world. Um, and I also weirdly agree with the Blanc, uh, Blancpain um, thing. Mm. If I had the money, I would love to try an X Fathoms. I know it's bonkers. It's like uh, the, the, basically half the distance from here to the sun in terms of width. But um, it's, got the, it's got a mechanical depth gauge. Uh, with a board and tube in it, uh, which I love. Um, there aren't many modern divers with a depth gauge attached, and so I would go from X Fathoms. I don't think it's the best. Um, it's ugly as all sin, but um, I would absolutely love to take that diving. I'd, I'd love to try on that the Omega from the, is it the Five Deeps or the Seven Deeps? The five, deeps. Uh, five Deeps, Five Deeps, which is, yeah. I did, not, I had it on, it's crazy. Is it heavy? It's titanium. It's titanium, so yeah, it's still heavy because it's super huge. It looks ridiculous, so it's nice. The amazing, th <laughs> the amazing thing about that is not only did they strap it onto that sub to take down there, but it was strapped onto one of the remote uh, drones that was left down there for the best part of the day. Wow. They managed to give it a nudge when they went down again to rescue yep. it and brought it back up again. These guys, what they did in those few days over the Marianas Trench was unbelievable. There's a fantastic article, I think maybe in the... New York Times, um, Postal Times, I can't remember which, but an absolutely brilliant article about them. And they are, without doubt, amazing, amazing tech. It's only 49 or $50 million, I think, for that Triton set. And you can go anywhere in the world. We should get one. Literally anywhere in the world. That's just awesome. Cool. Anyway, we should do a Kickstarter. Yeah. Cool. Right, Kickstarter. Temptation Island calls. Thank you very yeah, much. Thank you. So, um, thanks, uh, thanks, everyone, for joining us. Yeah, thank you everybody. Thanks to, uh, to RJ, to Bill, thank you Matt, thank you to everyone that's joined us um, live and hung out. Um, I hope everyone has a great week. Take care of yourselves and we shall see you soon. Thank you so much. Maybe we'll do dive watches again. Thanks. Bye. Bye-bye. Ciao.